All right, everyone who's been with us for three days, or this might be the first time that you've um, shown up to see our closing keynote. We are so excited. Dr. Hild and I had the pleasure of meeting Patrick, oh, probably about four or five weeks ago. Um, Patrick and R.L. Stein were on our podcast and it turned out amazing. We had so much fun with them. And he and his team that are here today, they are doing some great things. Um, I'm 42. They're going to talk about a podcast that they've made, and I've listened to pretty much all of them, and I love them. So they're not just for children. Adults can love them too, right? <laughs> so um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce each one of these people because they are just fantastic, and we are so lucky, honestly, and honored to have them here. So thanks to all of you for being here. All right. I love being here. It means I don't have to work. <laughs> exactly. Or you have to do work after you leave. Okay. Patrick Carmen is our first speaker. He um, had his first book published by Scholastic in 2007 and went on to become a New York Times bestseller. Over the next decade, he wrote dozen of, dozens of books for Scholastic, Random House, Little Brown, and HarperCollins. He currently has over 4 million books in print across 23 countries. Through his company, PC Studio, Patrick has created a variety of groundbreaking new ways for kids to read books, which he's going to talk about one of them today. It's not really reading, but it's listening. The company has developed software platforms for some of the biggest brands in publishing. And honestly, when I got to know him a few weeks ago, he is so fun. He's so cool. And I just feel so honored to have him here. So Patrick, thank you so much for being here. Well, you can introduce me anytime. That was outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Like, it's all true because I know all three of you are so busy and we're just lucky that you are here to talk to us about this. And that was better than my mom would have done. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Wow. <laughs> well, Jennifer Clary is our next entrepreneur. She's a producer and a director with a mission to share innovative services and impactful stories. She also founded um, Jin Kev productions in 2004, which is a media services for corporations such as GE Healthcare, Dow AgroSciences, Mazda, Toyota. She has done so many things that are so cool. They're, all of their bios are on the website, so you can go there. Um, she is a Vassar graduate and has two amazing children, Lyric and Jack, along with a herd of rescue animals. And she has just done so many cool things as an entrepreneur. So Jennifer, thank you so much for being here. Happy to be here. Maya. I think we should, I think we should tell the listening audience that you're, that Jack just threw up on you recently. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I was, I was saying, I, I actually don't have any pants on. My son like just puked on me. So this is like very, very casual tonight, but I'm thrilled to be here. And I think that what we're doing is really important for kids like my son even if they're yeah. gross. I 100% would, would agree with you. And that's mom life, right? If you haven't been thrown up on, then you're not really a mom, right? Exactly, exactly. I'm just living my truth over here. Yeah. Maya Glickman is our final one on the panel today. And she is a Los Angeles-based producer whose body of work spans numerous areas of entertainment industry. She has held key positions from development to production at Network Studios and some of the world's leading production companies. She has developed both major television and feature products. And in addition to major properties in the product, oh my goodness, sorry, podcasts and unscripted space. Uh, Maya founded a podcast company focusing on interactive, immersive narrative content for children, which is Go Kids Go, that officially launched in May, 2021. It features, um, a lot of different people. Like I was just saying, that's what they're here to talk to us about today. And I'm going to stop there because I'm going to let them just speak because you all are going to be captivated. So thanks to all three of you. Honestly, thank you so much. And I'm going to let you. Have thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having us. I'll kick us off and just tell you guys a little bit more about what Go Kid Go is and then how the company came to be. And then we'll dive into more of the fun stuff and have Pat, Pat lead us with the creative conversation. Um, so Go Kid Go is a podcast network for children that, you know, we've created a first of its kind Avengers like universe of repeating characters and storylines. Um, we're lucky enough to have worked with some really well-known talent like Ariel Winter, Danny Pudi, and Richard Kind, to name a few. Um, we drop daily show episodes from acclaimed children's um, book author R.L. Stein, most notably known for Goosebumps and Fear Street. 
and New York Times bestselling children's author, Patrick Carmen. Um, we feel like we've created a world for kids that's engaging, creative, and just entertaining for the whole family. So how this company came to be is, um, I think those of you who are entrepreneurial kind of know that companies are sort of born because the founders kind of see a problem and are aim to solve that problem. And we think Go for Kids Go really kind of fits that mold. Pat, Jen, and I, we really noticed um, a clear problem that became that much more apparent during the past few years in quarantine where kids were really glued to screens. Even prior to the pandemic, truly, um, children's average daily screen time was twice the recommended um, limit by the American Academy of Pediatrics. Since COVID, screen time has spiked four times the daily recommended limit, which is just bonkers to us. Um, really, to put that into perspective, kids in the six to twelve demographic are spending, you know, on the shorter side, six to eight hours of uh, in front of screens each day now, and we kind of see this as a really a public health crisis. Um, I have a background in entertainment. Jen has a background in building family friendly companies that do well by doing good, and Pat's a New York. Times bestselling children's author and just amazing creative uh, generator. So we all really kind of put our minds together, honestly, over Zoom because we're all in different states and have not actually met in person, which is we will never hilarious. we'll never meet the magical <laughs> diet no. we ever meet. <laughs> yeah, it's just kind of hilarious, but it bonds you that much deeper, in my opinion. So we decided that narrative podcasts for children would honestly be a game changer, not only for families, um, mm. but you know in a co-view, uh, co-listening experience, kids and parents alike during what has undeniably been a challenging time. We really think this is an entertaining resource to help combat these issues. So I'm gonna kick it off to the Pat to tell us some more about the specifics of our, of our shows. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for, for showing up late on a Thursday. I don't know what time it is where you are, but it's two o'clock where I am and it's smoky outside <laughs> in the Pacific Northwest, but we're, uh, that's what we're staying inside. If there's anything that uh, that you want me to talk about or cover, just, I've got the chat right up here. If there's something, uh, a specific question or a topic or category that you want to cover, just drop it in there and I'll, and I'll jump into that, no problem. Stop me anytime. Um, mm -hmm. Well, normally what I do is I go out and see kids at schools. And so I've seen about a million kids uh, live in gymnasiums all across the country. It's the perfect place to be famous, just in a gymnasium with fourth graders. It's great. No one else knows uh, who you are. Um, but you learn a lot by doing that. So when you when you're in a gymnasium and you've got three or four hundred little kids uh, hanging out with you, you can learn a lot about what is keeping them from turning pages, what kind of gets them interested, even kind of things you can see all kinds of patterns about what they're into, what they're wearing. I've, I just learned so much by being on the road, and I really miss that. Um, that is my that is probably the the favorite thing that I do as a writer is going out and talking to kids and it makes a really big difference. So um, for some kids, just meeting a writer is enough to get them turning pages. So they meet a writer and then they wanna read that book. Uh, I hear that all the time from librarians. And as I started doing projects that were more designed to reach kids who are not reading enough, uh, which is a lot of, of the kids in schools right now, um, I started to get librarians just even telling me at the end of a presentation, hey, will you swing by the library? We've got uh, the kids that are not reading a grade level and they want to sit down and talk with you and I'll sit down and talk to those kids. Well, we can't do that right now. And the longer this goes on, the more I wonder if I'll ever be able to do that again, uh, put a bunch of kids shoulder to shoulder in a gym uh, with somebody coming from outside the building. I don't know when that's going to be, um, but hopefully it'll be sometime soon. So that is a big reason why we decided to do this. And, and like Maya said, I mean, seeing a problem is, a, is, is one of the primary ways that these sort of uh, operations get started. And I can't believe we actually did this, to be honest. <laughs> when, when did we have this conversation? Six months, nine, I don't know when it was, but somehow we, we, uh, we all had the same feeling that kids were spending just so much time, a lot of them alone at home, staring at a screen and it's very income dependent. So the lower you are on the income scale, the harder this problem is because the simplest thing to do and we're not this is not uh, against any parent anywhere it's a it's it's not about that but the simplest thing to do is to just give them an ipad and you know once you do that in today's world let's count all the ways that that keeps young people from reading it's every everything's on the screen i mean now it's good now we've got TikTok, we've got snapchat we've got minecraft for younger kids we've got roblox for younger kids uh fortnite i mean the, the, all these things they are so distracting and so difficult to get away from. And they really make it hard for kids to be able to focus 
on one things and like light up their imaginations. The, the thing that's really interesting about screens is it has this sort of, I would almost call it like a magical ability to turn off your imagination. When you're watching TV later on tonight, just, just you'll notice it even in yourself. It's like your imagination just vanishes because everything is being fed to you. And so figuring out ways to get kids back to books is a big challenge right now. What people you know, tend to miss is, yeah, we might be coming out of this uh, pandemic that we're in pretty soon here, but regardless, you know, kids' brains are very elastic and they've picked up this habit, this, this 4X the amount of time they should be spending on screens. They pick that habit up and it's not going to just suddenly, they're going to stop doing that because they're going back to school. So these are, this, is a, this is now a pattern that we've got to really work hard to try and break. Um, so my, my journey to podcasting um, began with other things because I was, this was probably 10, 12 years ago as I was going out and seeing schools, I was already starting to see a lot of kids with phones and starting to see a real drift from them actually just loving the idea of reading. And so I started coming up with projects that were designed as a bridge back to books. And it's funny because when we first started doing these, I did these with Scott. So I did this, this is one, it's called 39 Clues. Some of you may have seen this before. This has about 60 million uh, copies in print across the series. That was the first big one. And the idea there was with the core group of people that the first writers is Rick Riordan and a few other people and, and an editor's class, we sat down and we're like, we got to figure out some way to bring kids back around. And so this is kind of like, you know, you, you read this book, but there's also a big clue hunting adventure online that kids get to participate in. And there's big, there's like, there's playing cards that are hidden in the inside jacket of the, of the book. So they buy the book, they open that up, they peel the cards out and then they go online and they start searching for stuff. And what that did, it was kind of the first gateway into, this is a book that you can read, but there's also this other little carrot over here that if you read this book, you're also going to be able to do some other fun things that you, you tend to like to do. That led to Skeleton Creek, which is this one. Um, this book is one that you that kids read and watch. And so this is a project where you read one character's perspective, and then it comes to a page in the book, and there's a password and a, and a website. You go to the website, you put the password in, and you watch part of the story. And it goes back and forth like that all the way through the whole book. This has become one of the most popular uh, series for middle school librarians and teachers to use to get kids back into books because it's, it's it, again, it gives them a chance to take a little break, watch something, and then come back to the reading. So that's been really fun. And so you can see that there's a progression here. And so now I think with podcasting, the, the funny thing is you think, well, it's not really, it's not really related to books, but it so is. I mean, really, the, if you if you do the research, the one area that's growing by far the fastest in publishing in general is audio. In fact, there are many of my contemporary authors who are now having the, the, the conversation with their editors about, should we even print a book? Maybe we should just go straight to audio. That's becoming an actual conversation because audio is becoming so prevalent. And so with kids, it is a great way to get them thinking about the idea of reading. Kids who listen to podcasts are much more likely to actually want to read books. So there is a connection there. But podcasts also, or audio in general, in our case, it's podcasts. Audio has a, another function, um, a couple of things that books actually don't have. One of those things, which is really important, is context. And so kids who listen to a, one of our stories, they're going to get context in a way that they wouldn't get if they were reading, right? Because they can hear the voices and it's a very personal experience listening. I'm sure all of you have listened to at least one podcast. It's in your head, it's very personal and you can really get a sense of, you know, how are these people acting? And all of our shows are narrative shows, they're story-driven shows. So you can, kids can get a sense of how they might act in the real world or they might see situations that they've seen themselves. And then the other thing about it is, as I said earlier, you know, the problem with screens is income dependent. The lower you are on the income scale, the more problem you probably have with screens. And the great thing about, about podcasts is that they're free. And they're sort of like, so they're sort of like the public library. I love public libraries because they, they level the playing field. And in the same way, every kid has access to these shows, to any podcast that they want to, that they want to listen to. And I think that's really cool. So when I was building this um, slate of shows, I really felt strongly based on everything that I had learned out in schools that the setting really matters. There has to be characters that like a lot of different kids, different types of kids can relate to. And ideally it's really, it is really like an Avenger style universe. That was whoever came up with that idea, Stan Lee or whoever it was, 
uh, a connected universe of, of characters and shows and comic books, whatever you want to call it, that's a very, very good idea. And the reason for that is because it builds in, in all this familiarity. You can tell totally different stories, but there's a familiarity with the setting that kids come to love. And then they can sort of drift around from show to show. So I'll show you really quick here. I'm just going to jump off and share my screen. See if I can do this right. I think it's this one. Hopefully you guys can see our website there. I bet you can. And so we have a, a, a world that we've built where many different shows are in the same world. And so what happens is a kid will be listening to one of our shows. And in that show, they might meet a character that they really relate to and really like. And that, that character actually has spun off into their own show. And that happens over and over again. So this, this is the kind of the world map, but all these different characters have their own shows. So it allows kids to kind of cross pollinate between shows, find the ones that they really love and uh, feel like they're really comfortable in the universe. And we're gonna just keep on adding more shows to this universe for, for different types of kids. So really quick, I'll just run through this so you know what you know what these are in case you have kids that you think might enjoy this type of thing. I was talking to someone this morning about a different project and they said, I have a five-year-old son who really likes superheroes. I said, well, they're gonna want the Bobby Wonder show. So Bobby Wonder is, a show about a kid who's an alien. He doesn't know he's an alien. And the show begins on his 10th birthday and that's when his alien powers kick in. And his parents tell him, oh, by the way, we're not really from around here. And he finally learns that this is true. And he, his job is to protect this world of Pflugerville from another character named Mighty Mila, who we may spin off into her own show at some point because she's become quite popular. Um, so that's a great one if you have a kid who's like into superhero type stuff. It's also very funny and fun. All of our shows, besides Story Train, are designed like, it's it's a little bit like listening to Nickelodeon. That's, that's how I like to describe our shows because at the end of the day, we are not trying necessarily to teach kids science or math or reading or any of those types of things. The big win for us and really for kids is just getting them to listen at all. So we wanna really make sure they're just having a good time because if they're listening, that's helping their vocabulary. It's helping their, uh, their, their like being able to understand information, helping them understand context. It's a lot of the same things that they get out of reading. So just getting them reading or getting them listening is our, is our primary goal. Uh, Flusville, that second one there that's purple, that actually is underneath the world of Pflugerville, the main island there that I showed you. Down underneath there is this world. And this is the most SpongeBob type show that we have. It's just a zany show about two characters. This over here, this little guy, little brown guy, this Waffle and Martha, who kids go off on adventures with and just have these zany, fun adventures that are just really great uh, entertainment for kids. Lucy Wow is a builder and a maker. So this is a great STEM show if you have a daughter or if you have a son that uh, likes this sort of like anything with science, technology, engineering, math. She's a builder. She has a big red barn where she makes all kinds of stuff. This little character in the corner, that's Kapow. That is a mechanical pygmy goat that she built and that's her sidekick. And so all kinds of cool inventions uh, and a really fun place for kids to learn a little bit about science and also just be encouraged that, that uh, being a kid and being into that kind of stuff is, is really cool. Uh, we obviously, uh, we talked about this earlier, the R.L. Stein show. So that's Bob Stein. That's a person that I've known for many years and Bob has uh, been gracious enough to let us make a show out of his books. He has 400 million books in print. So a lot of people don't realize how popular he is. He's the third most, most famous writer, living writer on the planet right now. So a lot of books with, with Bob. And so if you go into a school library anywhere in the United States, you'll see probably between 40 and 100 Goosebumps books. Um, they're just ext extraordinarily popular. Uh, and so we're doing a podcast with him. That's really good if you have somebody who's maybe a little bit older. These are not scary stories. These are more like strange stories. It's kind of like the Twilight Zone for kids. Um, and there are a bunch of those. That's a, that's a great thing if they're maybe fifth grade, sixth grade, maybe even seventh grade. And then story train is great if you have young kids or you're an adult who likes to listen to a story while you're about to go to sleep. Um, I, I really like these. These are like the kind, you know, they're like 10 minutes of like a really charming little story that's designed to sort of make you a little, <laughs> little bit sleepy. Uh, you might not make it to the end, but you can always pick it up the next time. And uh, then we have some other shows that are in our subscription model, but those, that's, that's the primary universe of our, of our shows. And um, one of the things I wanted to cover too is that we think it's really, really important that these shows have really good voice talent. Um, I don't know how, if anyone has ever listened to a narrative show, like a full cast audio that doesn't have good acting, but it really takes you out of the experience. And so 
all the people you see here, most of them are, are actors that you've seen on TV. The ones that you haven't are all people who are doing shows on places like Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network, and they really know how to make this kind of stuff come to life. And uh, it makes it pretty easy on me. I can write the telephone book and these people can make it sound pretty good. So, um, so what else? Oh, and there, there are study guides, there are activity guides. If you're someone who want, you know, you're really into this sort of idea of being able to listen to something and then also go in and, and do a little study on it with your kids or in a classroom, we have study guides, we have coloring pages, we have all, all, all kinds of stuff that you can get uh, that's all free. Um, we believe that these are really good co-listening shows also. I'm sure we've all had the experience of watching Barney or what did I used to watch with my kids? I used to watch um, the Teletubbies. Oh boy, that was rough. Rough half hour. Um, and there's probably some show I don't know about that's the rough show right now that you have to sit and endure. Um, these are really designed to be entertaining for adults also. That, you know, we're not talking down to kids at all. They're going to miss a few things, but but these are more in the Pixar range in terms of like, there's going to be some stuff you'll find funny that they may not quite get. So we think they're, they're fun for, for adults also. Okay, I'm going to pass it off here. I'm going to stop this share. And uh, again, any questions at all, put them in the chat. I'd be more than happy to hang back and, and answer them. We're going to uh, switch over to, to Jen for now. Hi, everyone. Pat's a tough act to follow, but I'm going to give it a go. Uh, I'm going to dive a little bit more into our mission and why it's important and why we think that the resources that we provide as a company are materially significant. Um, so there is a strong correlation at this point that's been drawn uh, through a number of studies about children who listen to podcasts, specifically narrative podcasts, uh, correlating to be more adept at reading. Um, so children who listen to podcasts actually report higher enjoyment of reading. It's 47.8% compared to 40.8% and read daily, 30% um, compared to 27%. That's really significant. And it painted a significant picture for us as founders because we by proxy feel that the more children we can get listening to Go Kid Go shows, stimulating their imaginations and proving out that brain development more readers are being developed. And as Pat said, it's very habit forming all of the screen time. And so being one of the tools in the toolkit to help break down that habitual being fed data, fed pictures, fed visuals, rather than stimulating that brain development and imagination, we're really proud to be a part of that. And I think if you take a beat and really think about why literacy matters, that's also crucial to the conversation around Go Kid Go and why we exist. So right now, just to make you aware of sort of the current situation in the US, if you aren't already, 20% of Americans read below the level needed to earn a living wage. That's pretty scary. And 50% of American adults can't read a book written at an eighth grade level. So that in general, you know, it sort of sounds like scaremongering, one of these stats that you might read and you think, ooh, that doesn't sound great, but, you know, it doesn't impact me, it doesn't affect my family. Well, let us actually look at this from a community standpoint, right? Like, what is the economic impact of low literacy on the United States? So the decreasing trend in reading proficiency over the past few years, it's cyclical and it's of universal concern. Um, children who are not reading at a proficient level by the fourth grade are four times more likely to drop out of high school. That is really terrifying, right? Because from a national standpoint, on an economic level only, we're going to delve into the social in a minute, that costs our country more than $240 billion in lost earnings, lost tax revenues and expenses and social services annually. Right. So if you just take all emotion out of it and you just look at the problem objectively, this is a crucial national issue. Right. Like it's not just about, you know, one family or two families. It, it matters no matter where you're looking at the, the problem from. And then the social impact of low literacy is is even sadder, really, I think, and more tragic because dropping out of high school increases the level of poverty. Um, it causes strain within families and it actually threatens the fabric of our community. I think one of the most sobering statistics is that three out of five people in American prisons cannot read. Um, and in fact, some states look at how well elementary schools in their area are performing to determine the future number of prison beds that will be required. Um, this is deeply sad. Um, one of the things that I had the honor of doing in my last company, which uh, focused on infants, so it was quite a different demographic, 
um, was that I actually got to go into prisons in California and engage with um, you know inmates who had committed you know major crimes for the most part, and uh, that's one of the things that they discuss is that the, the lack of access to books, the lack of um, being exposed to books, literacy, really held them back, prevented them from maybe getting um, you know gainful employment, uh, decreased their self esteem, and, and, and just in general created this dichotomy within society between the haves and the have nots. Um, so Go Could Go really aims to be proactive in our approach, right? Like I think instead of planning for future prison beds, it makes a lot more sense to get in early with creative ideas and reach kids sooner with literacy tools that make sense. So maybe not all kids are eager to pick up a book out the gate, but as Pat was saying, and as he's demonstrated through his previous projects, sometimes a creative approach can yield much much better benefits. And I think audio has been an untapped resource. I mean, when you look at the number of children on the autistic spectrum who may be able to read but lack the ability to comprehend something in a different format that tries to stimulate more kids' brains being universally accessible can make all the difference for us as a society between um, success when it comes to literacy and failure. And Go Kid Go is really proud to uh, take that proactive stance and put children first. So that's where that's where we stand as a company and that's why we do what we do. So I'll turn it back over to our CEO, Maya, to uh, close it out. And then we're happy to take questions as Pat said. Yeah, thank you. I mean, um, I think we're all just incredibly proud of what we've accomplished. And I looked back in our records, Pat, it was December that we all decided to go full steam ahead for this company. And what, what I, you know, I'm so proud that within six months we launched and, you know, have adjusted according to the feedback we've gotten and always leading with quality first. And I think that's what makes us stand apart is um, even if it seems like a silly idea, we really go at it in a way that it feels elevated from just the quality of our team and infrastructure that we put together of Emmy award winning, you know, composers and audio engineers and, you know, first in class with writing and talent. And um, we just believe kids deserve more than they have right now. And we feel like this could be a really big game changer as they discover that we exist. Um, that there's this resource that not only is leading with entertainment, but is acknowledging what kids are hungry for. And, um, and I think Pat's a, you know, very, very much a genius in terms of tapping into the, the, the brain and mindset of the age range that we're, we're aiming for with acknowledging the parents and wanting them to come on that ride with us. So just really thank you guys for, for hearing us out and checking out our website and, and becoming fans of the Go Kid Go world. And, you know, please rate, review, give us, you know, hopefully five stars, let us know what you love so we can continue to deliver and acknowledge um, what people are hungry for. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> and there are just mostly just comments coming in about uh, some of these resources maybe being useful for some of you. Um, I'll give you just a little, just a little more so you, so you know what you're getting yourself into based on uh, how old your kids are or maybe kids that you know. Um, you know, I think Go Kid Go, the, the, these shows that I, that I showed you really are good for just about any age. I think uh, we have kids that are down as low as like two years old that listen to these shows because they're going to, they'll catch some of it and they won't catch all of it, but it's a much better way to um, have a very young child uh, be entertained if you're busy doing something else than it is to put them in front of a screen. I mean, they can, the nice thing about audio is they can also sit in color or they can sit in do a craft or play with their animals or whatever while they're listening. And what we find also with, with audio is that it's very much repeat listening that, that happens. So we have, of course, all the statistics on our shows and we have lots and lots of kids, probably over half of our, uh, our entire audience who re-listen to episodes multiple times. And so you see this a lot with, you would think this would be, make sense when you're thinking of like a, um, you know, like a TV show, you would, kids would re-watch that but it is also very common for them to do that with audio. So if you find a show that your kids like, they'll probably just re-listen to them over and over again because, um, you know, it, again, it activates their imagination and they're having a good time. So that can go really young and it can also go probably pretty old uh, for kids who are, you know, you the, the play, what, I think one of the most important things that Jennifer said was that if we lose kids by the fourth grade, or maybe you didn't mention this part, but it's really tough to get them back after the fourth grade. Yeah. So I don't know if that point was exactly made, but, but, you know, 
when the when kids are below uh, reading below grade level at the fourth grade, it's very tough to get them back because it, and it makes sense if you think about it in the world we live in today. I mean, most kids by the time they're I don't know maybe fifth grade, sixth grade have their own smartphone, and then all bets are off. If they don't, if they haven't caught up by then, it's going to be tough for them to catch up uh, from there. Yeah. Um, so those are those are great for any age. I think Skeleton Creek is a that's a that's a scary story. It's written for probably 10 and up. I mean, it's not that it's, it's very much a PG sort of a scare, but, uh, but that does the videos are you, there are ghosts in the videos and, and, and stuff like that. No, there's no gore or anything uh, like that, but there, that is probably not for a kid who would be younger than 10, but those books got banned in Texas for a while because kids were, because um, they got really popular in Texas and um, too many like eight-year-olds were, were, uh, were getting in there and watching that. So better for a little bit older kid, like 10, 11, 12. Uh, 39 clues again, nine to 12. And um, yeah, so there you go. I really appreciate anyone hanging around and listening to me talk uh, to all of us talk. Uh, you know, we're hard, hard at work trying to make something we feel really good about. And I know a lot of you are as well. And, and you, uh, we just appreciate you taking the time to, to hang out with us. And if there's anything else we can do, send your little or send your questions to Tisha, we'll get them to us and I'll be happy to answer them. Yeah. And as summer's coming, I just want to wrap up and say, you know, one thing to really consider is how our podcast can just be so enjoyable for the family, like car rides and getting kids to do chores and find a way to enjoy it. Like listen to an episode, do the dishes, you know? Um, so just make the most out of it and, and, you know, as you see fit, but just as Pat said, just really appreciate everyone just checking us out. Did you all share Go Kid Go in the chat? I just want to make sure that you shared the link. Oh. Make sure that you do that because um, I want them. I was going to do it, but I figured you. Yeah, I'll share it right now. Okay, perfect. And I will tell you, um, again, I've listened to them. I drive a lot. I had my niece in the car. Um, we drove eight hours. She did not want to stop listening. She's going into fifth grade. She started today. So I can tell you from firsthand that I love them. Um, my niece loved them, who's 11. Um, I haven't tried them out on anyone younger, but they are amazing. Go listen today. You will want to use them in your classroom with your kids at home. Um, share them. It's, they're really cool. Thank you, Tisha. Thank you. They Thank really, you. I, I, I love podcasts. So um, I'm usually true crime, <laughs> but your, to... your, your, your podcasts are really, really good. They're amazing. We need like a fourth grade true crime. That's where we're, we got to work on that. Mr. Yeah. Somebody, stole my, somebody stole my pencil. <laughs> yes. So I'm going to let you all take questions. I'm going to stop the recording. So um, anybody can.